Advance them at your own. May advance them myself. Okay. Oh, just use the arrow. Okay, yes. perfect. And use the uh, sort of microphone. It's great. Wonderful. Yes. So Thanks. Thank you so much. Time. On the minute. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Ágætu gestir, um, ég býð ykkur velkomin til þessa fundar Varbergs, uh, Norðurslóðanetsins og Háskólans og Akureyri. Erindi hér er að tala um, um varnir uh, á Norðurslóðum. Uh, öryggi og varnir á Norðurslóðum hefum fengið til okkar hérna góða gesti. Uh, við þurftum aðeins að aðlaða daskrana, það var hér næstum full morgunvél uh, í, með gestum úr Reykjavík og, og uh, Bell frá, frá Vardamálaráðanetinu í Bandariska að við kerðum í morgun klukka sex og við komum hér akkurat á mínútinni fyrir þennan fönd. Um, en, uh, dear guests, uh, I would like to uh, welcome you to this uh, conference on North, uh, uh, on the Arctic uh, Defense and Security. This event is held by uh, Warburg, the ATA in Iceland, which is a, an organization dedicated for discussion on international affairs, defense and security, and particular holding up the values of, of NATO, the, the North Atlantic Treaty Alliance. This is held in cooperation with, with the uh, Iceland Arctic Cooperation Network, which is based here in Akureyri, and the University of Akureyri. Co-hosts also are the Norwegian uh, uh, Embassy in Reykjavik, 
Uh, unfortunately, uh, they were planning to come here, but they, they, they will not be able to, to participate in the event like scheduled, uh, and, and also the Iceland Foreign Ministry. I would like to ask uh, Friðrik Thorisson from, from uh, the Iceland Arctic Cooperation Network to come uh, up here and, and moderate the, the event for us. Friðrik, floor is yours. Dear guests, it is truly an honor to be with you here today, uh, in no small part to your effort, uh, in spite of the storm that is besetting us. So it was uh, truly no joke. Uh, my name is Frederik Thorsson. I'm the communications manager of the Icelandic Arctic Cooperation Network. We're an organization that initiates and facilitates various types of projects and overall cooperation uh, within the sort of Arctic cluster here in Iceland. So uh, our scope is quite varied and it includes matters of security such as today. So uh, I would then like to start off by thanking Varberg and the University of Akureyri and the Norwegian Embassy in Reykjavik uh, for graciously hosting uh, this meeting about this very current and truly urgent matter, uh, which is primed to impact all of us, not just here in Iceland, but across the Arctic and indeed all around the globe. I extend my gratitude to our speakers here today uh, for graciously offering us their valuable time to share their insights on this important topic. Special thanks to uh, Njord and Matthew, uh, who traveled all the way up here to Akureyri to be with us today. Uh, Matthew, especially having driven up here uh, through uh, darkness and storm, but uh, being no stranger to such daring, I hope the, the, the trip wasn't too difficult. So um, the format of today is that of three lectures. They're hosted by our esteemed speakers. Njord Vekke, Matthew Bell and Rasmus Bertelsen will be participating online. Each will present their insights for about roughly 30 minutes, at which point we will open up the floor and invite participants, both online and in person, to a Q&A. Um, if you are online, please feel free to insert your questions that you may pose into the, the chat box, uh, and I will then propose it on your behalf. So ahead of us today is a topic of grand proportion. And so with great enthusiasm and without further ado, I would like to present Njord Vege, professor at the Norwegian Defense University College to the podium. Njord. the speaker, right? So uh, great to be here. Thank you for the introduction. And uh, it's actually my second time to Akureyri. And um, for a Norwegian to coming to uh, Iceland, it's kind of like uh, coming home in a way. You know, it's very familiar landscapes. Uh, the people are very similar and the names on the streets and on, uh, you know, stores and uh, the language you hear is very interesting. It sounds like a mixture of Norwegian dialect and very old fashioned old Norse. So it's really, really exciting to be in Iceland again. And I'm also happy to have uh, my um, uh, colleague here from Ted Stevens Center. Great that you made it here and, and Rasmus in uh, Tromsø, I understand. So <clears throat> yeah, so I'm a professor at Norwegian Military Academy. Uh, that is where we teach the uh, army officers, like their bas <coughs> basic officer training. I'm a political scientist and part of the, uh, also part of the Greater Defense University College. So uh, one of my research interests has been security and defense in the Arctic. So it's a, it's a good topic. So uh, I'm thinking about uh, three uh, overall topic uh, for my presentation. Uh, Arctic politics, a little bit more general. Uh, how is the Arctic in today's great power competition that we see globally? And how should we assess Russia and Russia in the Arctic now after having fought a war in Ukraine for a couple of years? Uh, to what degree is it a threat to our part of the world? 
and I'll look into NATO countries in the Arctic, uh, see how they are uh, preparing and to what degree they are ready to operate here, and a little bit on the way forward. So um, if we should take the big picture and see the background for this uh, topic, uh, there's no doubt that the current situation globally is uh, less predictable than we have had for a while. Um, military power is used directly to accomplish uh, political agendas, especially in Ukraine, uh, I'm having in mind. And um, there's an overall kind of competition between authoritarian style uh, regimes and democratic systems. And of course, uh, also China is on the rise, the second largest economy, increasing their military capabilities. They have interest all over the world and are being more um, explicit about their uh, preferences, interests, etc. So if we look at the Arctic, there's no doubt that um, it traditionally has been a region characterized by uh, low tension. Uh, there's been a lot of institutional cooperation in this part of the world. And it has been a quite stable part in spite of having a lot of, let's say, military infrastructure, military platforms operating there, etc. But recently, uh, the global sort of like more tense environment has also, I would say, um, made its way into the Arctic. And we can definitely see a more um, pointed, uh, let's say, competition and especially after the Crimea annexation in 2014, uh, cooperation have been more difficult also in the Arctic. And as we all know, after the full-scale war and attack on Ukraine, uh, there has been very little cooperation in the Arctic between Russia and the Western states. Um, so this is a picture from the border uh, between Norway and Russia up in Finnmark, the northernmost part of Norway. So if we, if we look at the, the governance system in the Arctic, uh, the crucial sort of like feature is that we have sovereign states with sovereign rights. And uh, since it's a large maritime region, the law of the sea has a crucial role. Uh, it gives a lot of um, sort of like rules for how uh, to play and it's generally respected. However, there are also important uh, governance structures like Arctic Council. We have had the Coast Guard Forum in the Barnes region in Northern Norway. We have had a, a unique cooperation. Uh, most of that are on hold or frozen, uh, not working anymore. So it's a, it's a, it's a new situation in many ways. Uh, I also added, you know, we have a lot of research going on there and, and states might use research as a as a venue for presence, a venue for having a say, uh, in addition to the sovereign states that are, you know, basically owning the Arctic through their territories. So uh, on the Norwegian border, it has dramatically changed. So a few years back, uh, it was a lot of cross-border people-to-people cooperation. Today, after the Ukraine war, we see a demonstration supporting the Ukraine war. And this uh, picture on the right side is from, I think it's Chirkenes uh, friendship city across the border, and uh, which has been uh, abolished now. And much of what was established through, you know, decades of low tension after the Cold War has more or less been reversed. And Norway definitely feel uh, there's a more unstable and unpredictable and dangerous neighbor, even though, um, uh, it's further south on the European continent that the actual conflict are. So let's look into a little bit about uh, this threat. Uh, I'll see, uh, I'll investigate a little bit the conventional threat, but also the hybrid uh, aspect and come back to that. So if we look into the national security strategy from 2022, so there's like feedback from. Uh, Um, uh, yeah, so in, in uh, the national defense strategy uh, from the US, Russia is specifically stated as an acute threat. And 
how should we interpret this? So from the Norwegian perspective, uh, it's hard to you know, have a presentation like this without mentioning the so-called bastion defense concept. So during the Cold War, uh, while uh, Russia was or Soviet Union was developing their um, naval assets at the Kola Peninsula, that's the northwestern peninsula of Russia, uh, it was established that Russia probably wa would like to protect their nuclear second strike capabilities in the Kola Peninsula by you know, keeping allied forces out of the Norwegian Sea, basically trying to deny activity there. So this bastion defense concept uh, was made public, I would say, uh, a few years back and has dominated the debate on how should we plan to defend uh, northern parts of the Norwegian, Sw Swedish, Finnish uh, territory in case of a conflict with Russia. And there's good reasons to doubt that Russia would be able to, to control such a large area. Um, and especially now, after significant losses in Ukraine, one could, you know, question this. But what is also the case is that Russia have not really lost a lot of their fleet uh, or northern fleet assets or their strategic air power and their ability to deny or um, control uh, the area militarily. So, and one could also ask what about with climate change if the ice is shrinking, new technology where you don't need to be so close to, let's say, the western side, would Russia move their assets further east? There's a lot of debate on this. So this is a good starting point. And uh, <clears throat> so, and here's also a map where we see many of the key uh, bases that Russia is uh, refurbishing and modernizing in the Arctic. And it's a testing ground for a lot of new technology, new uh, capabilities. And uh, as of today, uh, Russia has moved much of their um, production into a war time or war footing. So really increased their capabilities, uh, including their uh, development of these uh, northern uh, defense structures. So here's one of the key um, uh, facilities on Franz Josef's land. And as we see, uh, it has a very, let's say, um, uh, unique range all in all directions here and is definitely one of the key uh, defense uh, infrastructure, um, uh, yeah, uh, constructions that, that Russia recently have modernized and are um, expanding, I would say. So uh, how should we interpret this? Is it defensive or is it for offensive purposes? Usually most military capabilities can be used both ways. But for the West, this is certainly uh, something we should consider when we look into the, the balance of power in the Arctic. And if we have a more um, zoomed in picture here, um, this has long been the, the problem, uh, the, the, the core strategic assets are very close to the Norwegian border. How should we plan for a potential conflict? Uh, one would expect the Russians to try to protect their assets. But now with Finland and Sweden joining NATO, it's a completely new picture because as you can see on the, on the uh, picture down to the right, uh, the access to this uh, northeastern part of Norway was very, very hard. But now with NATO uh, including all Nordic countries, it's a completely new defense problem. Uh, and it's a positive development, of course, from the Western side here, but all uh, old plans need to more or less be, you know, remade, and it goes with logistics and also command structure, etc. There's also another uh, uh, picture here: open access, uh, commercially available. So there's a lot of um, fleet facilities still being developed up here, and uh, it's it's certainly one of the most um, prioritized military uh, regions in Russia in spite of the conflict in Ukraine. However, there are also uh, something called like hybrid threats that's typically 
between you know a deep peace and a full scale war, you might have like a blurred area. And it's hard to define. And I've been working in a project where we were specifically trying to define uh, hybrid warfare or what is it? Uh, does it exist? Is it something new? Is it nothing new? And we came up with this description of it at least. Uh, hybrid warfare is the synchronized use of multiple instruments of power tailored to specific vulnerabilities across the full spectrum of societal function to achieve synergistic effects. So it's a kind of a mouthful there, but <clears throat> In order to qualify as a hybrid or yeah, a hybrid threat, it should be synchronized multiple you know, sources of power or tools of power across this full spectrum. So it shouldn't just be a cyber attack or you know, a single information campaign trying to spread false news. But if you do it on a massive scale across the, spec across the board against the so uh, society, you might have uh, this kind of uh, hybrid warfare. And it sort of messes with Western thinking when it comes to the, the um, uh, binary relationship that we usually think of when we think about peace and war. And um, I would say it's, it's like becoming more mainstream to accept that there might not be such a binary relationship between peace and war necessarily. There might be a continuously competition where um, great powers try to weaken each other, for example, with uh, campaigns or tools that are hostile. And um, especially after Crimea 2014, this became like an eye opener for the West, where uh, Russia were able to capture and annex Crimea almost without a shot being fired or any violence being used. So to what degree could they you know, do that elsewhere? Uh, are we prepared for that? And basically, this is the strategy when you are not the dominant military power. So, so there's no doubt that Russia would be less capable than a combined NATO alliance, but still they might try to weaken NATO, and how should they do that? Probably through other tools of influence and uh, sometimes labeled hybrid warfare. We can come back to it. So what's the situation on the Western side? <clears throat> so this picture is from, uh, again, from the border. Um, it's a river uh, dividing uh, Norway and Russia, many pl places there. And um, if we take sort of like the overall look here, uh, there's no doubt that uh, the northern flank of NATO is, is isolated from most, most other parts of the lines. It's, it's very long distances, so if you should have a significant military operation, let's say in northern Norway or northern Sweden, northern Finland, it's actually quite difficult to get there and to resupply with fuel, uh, food, uh, and especially if there's a conflict going on and communication is maybe, you know, uh, put out of order, etc. So that's, a, that's sort of like the bottom line here. Um, so what is happening is that uh, after uh, 2014, and especially 2022, there's a, um, a renewed focus on peer competition. It's not necessarily ISIS or Taliban or Al-Qaeda with desert warfare where the, the Western states have a complete dominance in cyber and air power and basically can control everything. It's a peer where um, there's a need to rebuild many of those capabilities the West and NATO had during the Cold War. So for 20 years, the Americans weren't very much up in, let's say, northern parts of Scandinavia training during winter time. But now the last few days, uh, sorry, the last few years, they've been much more regularly present and have understood it a lot to relearn. and. Uh, Having lived in Tromsø, for example, which is not so different from Akure, um, there's quite often now, I would say, Americans, US Marines typically, or US Army training there. But as you can imagine, it's like extremely hard if you're coming from, let's say, Texas or New York or Florida, showing up at Setamun, northern Norway, during January, like 
20 minus you can't you, you're just stuck so, so to be able to operate to be um, independent of electricity or uh, road networks takes a lot of effort so therefore our local forces is of course very important uh, the national forces here so just a couple of pictures you know back in the cold war days we were expecting the russians or the soviet union potentially coming across the border from finland and there's a lot of um, mountains where a very very significant uh, defense infrastructure was built but in these days this is probably not how a conflict would look like so um with um, new sort of con conceptuals uh, deriving from new technology and changes there's an there's a need to sort of like investigate to what degree we can utilize the concepts the the hardware um, the ways of exercising in in this part of the world and for example the u.s marines have uh, something called force design 2030 it's basically targeted towards operating in the pacific uh, how to meet a uh, rising Chinese power fighting in the islands in the Pacific. So to what degree can you transfer that to the Arctic, for example? That would be a big question, and I'm working on those things in my research. And also the U.S. Army have similar sort of conceptual developments. So has the Air Force, and it's the Norwegian, uh, the figure here. But So basically it's about how to combine all your domain into sort of like a coherent, multi-layered, multi-domain type of fashion. And it works and looks good on paper, but it's like extremely difficult to do in practice. But this is what the Allied forces and NATO are training, try to do like this, not only within their national capacities, but also across the lines or within the lines. And for, uh, the northern parts of Norway, Finland, Sweden. We have typically cooperated with the US Marines here at 2MF, 2nd Marine Expeditionary mm -hmm. Division, that are preparing to you know, basically operate in the entire world except Asia, also including the Arctic. Uh, they are important, but are very focused on the, on the Pacific. And then you have uh, the second, uh, the 11th uh, Airborne Division in the U.S. Army now stationed in Alaska with uh, across across your I don't know office facilities. <laughs> so um, so uh, in Norway we see these two, I say, key branches of the U.S. Uh, training more targeted towards. Uh, Pacific with the with the Marines, but to some degree also towards the Arctic and and the U.S. Air, uh, Army and their 11th Air, Airborne Division are 100% focusing on like cold weather operations now, including Norway. But as we saw on the uh, on the map, it's difficult to fly in to let's say northern Norway, northern Finland across the North Pole. That's a very rough flight. So, but this is. Uh, this is uh, going on. And uh, during this Cold War, Norway um, hosted and developed in cooperation with Americans a lot of caves where uh, the US Marine had uh, significant um, uh, hardware uh, pre-positioned. And that's still the case. That's a, that's a globe that is like a multiple of those halls of caves. And it's basically for the entire world, but it's located in northern and central Norway. So uh, it, the U.S. Marines is definitely on board here. And a couple of pictures from the Marine Corps University where they are, you know, training on um, how to operate in the Arctic. <coughs> so uh, going towards the end here, um, some reflection overall of the situation and uh, the way forward. So I think we should recognize and just realize that there's a new situation in the in the arctic in the in the high north uh, it's more competition it's certainly more uh, singling with military platforms like flying sailing military exercises but also like bullying behavior um, after ukraine war especially uh, deterrence is much more important so 
um, back in the days, Norway and for, for decades have tried to balance reassurance with deterrence. But now it's difficult to have the same kind of reassurance mechanisms with a full-scale war going on in Ukraine, where where um, uh, Russia have attacked and you know occupied, and are of ongoing uh, have an ongoing war. So how should we deal with this? So I would say that the tendency is to to, to pay more um, emphasis on deterrence, and the same with nuclear weapons has probably increased in role. So with Russia being weakened and having most of their uh, second strike capabilities in the Kola Peninsula, uh, the, new, the role of the nuclear weapons have probably become more important. So uh, the use of hybrid levers of power has also increased. So it's, it's difficult to imagine a land intrusion in Northern Europe from Russia today, but there's like constantly what we would call like hybrid campaigns or information operations, cyber attack, jamming of GPS signals, etc., cutting of cables. So uh, even though there's peace, there's a lot of hostile action going on. So uh, I think the outcome of the Ukraine war will have a significant impact on you know the future of, uh, security uh, security structure of Europe including how things will be in the Arctic. Russia will remain the biggest Arctic power and have a natural place in the Arctic and in Arctic governance. But as long as there's a hot war going on, it's difficult to, to see how this will you know, be in the, in the few years ahead. And I think there's a new a need for a new uh, mindset to be more aware of the competitiveness and uh, the sort of um, the interest-driven behavior that are not necessarily uh, uh, overlapping with, let's say, Western interests and, and where Russia and China to a larger extent are competing as authoritarian systems towards uh, democratic systems. <coughs> so closing wars here. Uh, I think in this more competitive international system, uh, democratic states should be, um, uh, should improve their military capabilities, uh, also soci societal um, aspects of uh, resile, uh, having you know resistant ability to resist and uh, while at the same time promoting liberal values so we should you know up uphold rule of law uh, respect uh, yeah international uh, agreements etc and have transparent transparency in uh, actions and training patterns etc uh, and uh, the most important part of our resistance is probably the alliances that we have, you know, uh, like-minded nations uh, staying shoulder with shoulder with uh, with NATO, and and it's a it's a very positive development now with Finland and Sweden also joining NATO. So that was my presentation. Floor up for Q&A, yeah. if you sure. would. You want me to sit here? Or, or you may just stand okay. if you like, or you may also sit. So I have this uh, box here, so I'm going to be drawing it around. If anyone has any questions, I can uh, toss it to anyone. We have about 10-ish minutes for a Q&A until we go on to the next uh, lecture. So raise your hands. Yep. To get a short uh, question. Yes. Uh, can you tell me anything about the situation in Svalbard, where uh, it belongs? Norwegian, mm. Norway. Sure. And the Russians are present there too. Mm, exactly. So a big open question. So for those of you that are not specifically aware of it, uh, Norway uh, has the sovereignty over Svalbard, which has uh, the so-called Svalbard Treaty granting Norway sovereignty uh, over the archipelago as uh, sort of like a result of World War One. So in 1920, uh, the key powers, with Russia not uh, joining because it was a revolutionary war there, signed a treaty giving Norway uh, sovereign rights over Svalbard. However, it was also included a few, uh, let's say, exceptions where uh, all citizens of signatory states and their companies 
should be able to utilize resources on an equal footing with Norwegians. So it pertains to citizens and companies of the signatory states. And another uh, sort of, uh, let's say, unique feature was that Norway was not allowed to build military fortifications, uh, naval bases, or use the island for warlike purposes. So Norway has been reluctant with military activities on Svalbard. It's not like an absolute demilitarized region, but we don't have military infrastructure there or fleet bases or use it for warlike purposes. So uh, Russia have, uh, through the years, established presence there. It has been uh, politically motivated, non-commercial presence where they have subsidized uh, mining. And uh, if I should guess, perhaps there might be 400 Russians in Barnesburg, or earlier also Pyramid. Uh, an interesting fact is that most of those Russians were actually Ukrainians. So with the Ukraine war, uh, it has become much more, let's say, complicated for a Russian to sort of like continue as before. So there's a tendency towards Ukrainians leaving and Russians remaining and more Russians perhaps coming and fewer uh, Ukrainians. Anyway, uh, I would say it has uh, been a challenge for Norway maybe to keep a balance through the Cold War and after the Cold War maybe a little bit easier. The tendency is definitely to to regulate uh, uh, or to, to exercise the sovereignty in accordance with the Solar Treaty more uh, to the latter, to tighten um, for example, uh, regulations that should apply equally to everyone, not, uh, for example, giving the Russians so much leeway in Barnesburg, as maybe was the case during the Cold War, for example. Uh, but it's definitely, a, you know, a unique challenge how to, to, um, to keep the sovereignty while still adhering to the, to the treaty. So, I mean, please have a follow-up question specifically, but... Any other questions? Yes. I prefer we speak into this so the people on the stream can also uh, fully hear us. There you go. Thank you, Njord, for uh, um, an excellent and um, thought-provoking presentation. I, I'm going to admit that I'm one of these extremely naive people that keep a lingering hope that there may be chance of a de-escalation of the situation. But I will also admit that your words leave me uh, somewhat pessimistic, even more so than before. Um, let's assume that we could find a shared goal of de-escalation. Could you speculate on what that would require? Mm. So I think as things stands right now, the situation in Ukraine makes everything very difficult. So I showed you the picture, you know, from across the border there with the big pro-war demonstration from our friendship city. So it's obviously that you can't just continue as before, as if nothing happened. So, um, to, to, but if you, if you sort of like try to disentangle the Arctic from the Ukraine war, which is hard to do. I think, you know, everyone uh, see and recognize that Russia is the biggest Arctic state and their territory covers 50% of the Arctic and their, you know, uh, maritime regions, etc. So that will remain like that. And at some point there will be, you know, return to normalcy. Um, and uh, the sooner the better. But right now, I think there's, uh, there, it's not easy to do it because, you know, it's part of the global system. It's, kind, it's, it's part of, uh, yeah, the more tense relationship in, internationally. So this is what we've talked about for years, you know, it's connected to the, to the global situation and that's just the case now as well. Yes, thank you for your presentation. I have a question uh, about private military companies. And uh, are there any ideas how to fight, for instance, the theoretical threats which might come from the actions of, for instance, such groups, 
such companies as Wagner Group, which prove very, unfortunately, very uh, efficient in the war or in Ukraine. Thank you. So I, I'm not aware of any like specific, you know, plans towards that. But uh, I would say, you know, it's a peer, it's a peer competition situation where uh, it's, it's states staying behind also those private or potentially private groups uh, financing them, you know. So, um, so I think, I think uh, it, it doesn't make that much of a difference probably. Uh, I haven't, so I, it would just be speculation for me, I, I don't know. Hmm. I have a question on, on how uh, new membership of NATO for Finland and now hopefully Sweden. Mm. How will that play into this balance on 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 and, and the cooperation? And mm. maybe the second question: you being a professor in from in political science, uh, maybe if you could elaborate a bit on um, how this plays into at the council, uh, you know, having the Russians out and. and mm and the future of that organization. Sure, so uh, Finnish and Swedish NATO membership has a lot to say of how you should you know, defend the Arctic and the northern parts of uh, Scandinavia in case of a military conflict. Um, during the Cold War and also in the years after the Cold War in Norway, it has been a debate to what degree we should um, have, for example, mechanized heavy units or have only like long distance, small, light uh, patrols delivering, you know, missiles on long distance because it would be impossible to, def to fight the Russians in northern Norway. Now we have um, uh, Finnish and Swedish territory being, you know, uh, giving us a lot of lo logistical options and creating a lot of dilemmas for Russia in, in case of a conflict. So it, tur it turns everything upside down. And uh, in uh, the air, in the Air Force Corporation, uh, the um, Nordic uh, Corporation have come very far and they are more or less uh, operating really jointly as a, as a very strong and capable multinational air force. But it's harder to do on the land side and maybe also in the uh, navies, among the navies. But it, it's definitely turning everything around and making it more favorable for NATO, I would say. And um, with respect to the Arctic Council, so I think I think definitely Arctic Council have a future. Uh, I think there's some movement in the in the working group level where you have scientists, including Russians now, working together uh, with science. But um, to have cooperation on the political level would be difficult for for a foreseeable future, I think, as long as there's a war in Ukraine. Thank you, and we have time enough for one more question. Over there, we got you. Thank you. Uh, does the uh, current increase in military hardware production in Russia, does it change the nature of threat to the NATO alliance in the Arctic? Mm. Uh, basically, what they're producing uh, with what means and uh, basically the current uh, situation in the Arctic or Nordic flank? Does mm. it change the threat of the Russian, Russian? Uh, well, just change the nature of the Russian threat, basically? So I think we should um, characterize what's going on in Russia now. It's like a move to war footing production across the board, giving priority to military production at the cost of basically everything else in the society. And I mean, this does not sound like a viable solution for a very long time. So it, it certainly have negative impacts on society to, to continue like that. But uh, while um, Russia is doing that, we are seeing, you know, a much more um, complex Western response. Uh, I think there's a tendency towards, you know, increasing production, increasing, for example, ar artillery production or, you know, anti-air. Uh, capabilities. So let's uh, let's use Norway as an example. Uh, there's hardly any spare parts, any like ammunition on the on the storage halls. Everything has or a lot have been given to Ukraine. 
uh, we are ramping up production, but uh, not on a war uh, scale footing like, like Russia. And this is the case in most European countries, I think. So um, there's no doubt that the West have a greater industrial potential, but you know, to just completely turn over and, 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 and produ produce more uh, military um, uh, hardware on the cost at the cost of everything else doesn't work in in democracies so um, I think there's a there's a, an, evol a, an evolution of Russian capabilities like in five to ten years where they will be able perhaps to build up what they've lost but it depends so much what's happening in Ukraine as well and of course that happens depends on the US support in Congress etc so it's a complex uh, picture but but Europe are stepping up, but on a different footing than, than the Russians, at least. <laughs> yes, uh, it's very exciting. So uh, what an invigorating uh, discussion. There's a lot of questions still pending, and especially in the chat as well, which I would like to do justice. But this is all the time we have for questions for uh, your lecture. So thank you so much, Nord. Uh, really yeah. appreciate it. So thank you so much. Next up, uh, I would like to welcome Matthew uh, T. Bell. He's uh, the Dean of the School of Arctic and Climate Studies in the Ted Stevens uh, Center for Arctic Security Studies. Welcome, Matthew. Great, thank you. Good afternoon while they're bringing up the slide. So a little bit about introduction. So uh, it's great to be back in Iceland. So I've been uh, a number of times to the country in, in support of work that I do at the Ted Stevens Center, but also my prior work in the, in the Coast Guard. But this is my first uh, first visit to the, I'll call it high north in, our, in Iceland into Akari, but uh, reminds me of my hometown in Kodiak, Alaska. So lots of wind, lots of rain, lots of weather, and, and there's no bad weather, you just dress for it. So there's always bad clothing. Um, a, a little bit about my background. So I did 36 years active duty in the Coast Guard. Uh, so primarily a shipboard operator, uh, principally focused on search and rescue, law enforcement, uh, uh, humanitarian assistance and prevention actions in the North Pacific, Bering, Beaufort and Chukchi Seas on the Western United States and in Alaska. Uh, interactions with Russia, uh, China, Japan, Taiwan, uh, Saipan, mostly looking at, uh, at fisheries management in, in the high seas. Um, academically, I taught chemistry at the Coast Guard Academy for a number of years, also was responsible for the professional development of the cadets that were working through the Coast Guard Academy, and uh, have, uh, have a close proximity transit to Iceland a number of years back on the tall ship Eagle, so sailed a square rigger across the North Atlantic in March. I don't recommend that. Um, it's, it's, it's pretty violent, but uh, we ended up having to spend a week in Ireland as we had to take down one of the yard arms because we bent it uh, across in a, in a northern storm. Uh, so most of my approaches now uh, to, to security in the high north come from that lens, that background, and operating as a search and rescue expert, a fisheries management, fisheries enforcement in those, in those high seas. I transitioned to the Ted Stevens Center. Uh, so the Ted Stevens Center for Arctic Security is the newest of the regional centers to the DOD portfolio. Uh, stood up about two years ago, and I was I came on board as the dean for the School of Arctic and Climate Security Studies. And with that, I'll give you an introduction uh, to the Ted Stevens Center, a little bit about where our background is and, and what we've done in the past and, and, and how we came into fruition. So the Ted Stevens Center is the newest of the regional center. It's one of six. Uh, regional centers across the world that is focused on regional security from a Defense Department perspective. Uh, so we're the sixth uh, in Anchorage. It's the first one stood up by the United States in the last 20 years. Predominantly, the three out CONUS locations, so the Ted Stevens Center in Anchorage. The, uh, the more infamous, the first of the bunch, is the George C. Marshall Center that's in, in, in Garmisch, Germany, that focuses on European security. And then the Daniel K. Inoue Asia Pacific Center for Security Studies in Honolulu, Hawaii. And then the third, which is us, the Ted Stevens Center. And then there's three located, co-located at Fort McNair in Washington, D.C. 
and cooperatively, we focus on regional security across the world. The Ted Stevens Center is the first that goes cross boundaries, cross connected, um, focusing on Arctic security. So from a pan Arctic perspective, our focus is from the Western Bering Sea, if you will, from, from the little Diomedes Islands, all the way across from Alaska to Canada, to Greenland, to Iceland, to Norway, to Sweden, to Finland, to those borders of Russia. Um, and as, as was already communicated earlier, 50% of that space is owned by Russia. The other 50% is by those Arctic nations that, uh, that focus on, on issues technically connected to NATO now with, with Sweden's you know, pending accession into NATO very, very quickly. Our overall objectives for the center at large that's charged by, by the secretary when he stood us up was to advance Arctic awareness across the, the, the Arctic. We look to advance those DOD Arctic priorities and how they relate to those operations in the high north. We also look to reinforce a rules-based order in the Arctic, which I thought was very well communicated as it reflects back to those governing bodies, Arctic Council, Arctic Coast Guard Forum, IMO, and, and there's a number, a host of those that talk about, try to articulate this governance strategy in the Arctic. And then, of course, address the impacts of climate change. My opinion, the impacts of what climate does to those security practitioners on the ground. So how does that influence uh, Arctic security practices? But more importantly, we do this with and through our allies and partners across the entire region. We're the, sp the first specific center that asks to do that across boundaries. Uh, so we're aligned to the Office of Secretary of Defense for policy, for hemispheric defense and hemispheric affairs, specifically Arctic and global resilience. And then we have, I'll call it an operational connection back to the NORTHCOM NORAD commander. Each of the, re the regional centers are directly connected to a combatant commander. The Marshall Center, of course, uh, European command, and the, the Daniel K. Inouye Center is connected to the Indo-PACOM. At the same time, we also have our funding allocated through the uh, Defense Security and Cooperation Agency, and that they allocate our budget and our administrative uh, oversight. As was mentioned before, the strategic documents that dictate what we do as a center, the national security strategy, the national defense strategy, and one that wasn't listed up there is the national strategy for the Arctic region. And this is a new strategy that the White House promulgated last year, but more importantly here in the last few months, they've just now implemented the national strategy for the Arctic region implementation plan. And, and that focuses to look at uh, the advancing U.S. security interests across the Arctic. Uh, we look, of course, second priority is to mitigate the impacts of climate change, uh, environmental protection, economic development across the region, and then we also look to, to, to cooperate and collaborate with those international allies and partners, but specific mention of the indigenous peoples that already occupy that circumpolar uh, north. The, the newest of this regional center, so it, our, our boss likes to articulate, uh, we are building while doing. You know, for those in the, in the aviation side of the house, it's kind of like building your airplane while trying to fly it. You know, and from my perspective in the maritime setting, you've already launched the boat, and now we've decided to put the hull plating uh, aboard. And so trying to, trying to do things and build the center out at the same time is a unique challenge for a center that hasn't been in creation for, for like I said, uh, in more than 20 years. We focus on those DOD Arctic priorities, not just from a U.S. interest, U.S. military perspective, but those government agencies that are focused on supporting work in and through the Arctic, and we work through those allies and partners on the uniform side of the house in, the, in, in our allies' nations, but also through the various institutions that are focused on, on Arctic. Uh, academic universities, military think tanks, uh, military war colleges across the Arctic allows us as a center to connect the right folks. So part of our charge is to build out a network of collaborative, like-minded folks that are focused on security uh, in this region. Our vision, of course, is to focus on and advance a network of not only military, but civilian like-minded efforts. So if you think about the, the research that goes on at the academic levels at most of those universities, how does that play into scientific support for not only uh, informing uh, the 
climate change, climate security in the Arctic, but also influences industry and technology and energy aspects, not only from a, an industrial perspective, but a civilian capacity, but also how that influences, you know, Defense Department charges. Our center looks to build strong and sustainable domestic and international connections. Um, part of our team, yes, we're focused in Anchorage, Alaska, so call it near the Arctic at 61 degrees north, but our connections reach far and wide. Obviously, I'm here today. We've got colleagues in uh, Tromso this week for the start of Arctic Frontiers. We've had our own group of folks here in Iceland a number of times for Arctic Circle Assembly. We had folks in Rovamini talking about security in the high north, and I'll actually be in Stockholm in a couple of weeks to talk about uh, defense tabletop exercises that you can do uh, not only for defense of the Balkans, for the defense of the high north, but how is the interplay of Sweden and Finland now going inter inter impact to impact uh, the evolution of NATO as those accessions uh, are realized. We also look to develop three different aspects of the, of the center. The first of which that I'm in charge of is executive education for our Arctic practitioners. The second pillar is to build out a robust research and analysis uh, connection across the Arctic. And the third is to build a robust strategic engagement outreach division that allows us to put on seminars and symposiums, host them in Anchorage, but also host them uh, across communities near and, and close to the Arctic. We have a North American Arctic Security Workshop that we took to Nuke Greenland last year in cooperation with the, with the Danish government and the Greenlandic government, as well as Canadians. Uh, but now we're taking that to Qualuit in, in Nunavut uh, later this year, but also hopes to build that robust connection of like-minded coastal communities in Iceland, across that North Atlantic Bridge, as, as far uh, east as to Norway. And then, of course, our motto is to be committed to innovation and excellence. There is no one entity that has the right tool and the right resources to address all the challenges in the Arctic. So that's going to require us to innovate, not just from a governmental perspective, but also from a private equity, from a private enterprise st standpoint. How do we collaborate with industry? How do we work with education? How do we work with government to advance those ish ish initiatives to keep the Arctic peaceful and prosperous? When I say building while doing, so this is what we've done in just the last year and a half. Um, and so part of that consists of bringing folks to the Arctic, exposing folks to the Arctic to talk about the challenges. And so when you say I've been to the Arctic, uh, we have to be careful on how we define that. Because I can look to the backyard in Alaska, North American Arctic, and, and that viewpoint from Utkiavik or Barrow is very, very different than what that view is from here or what that view is from a populated uh, Nordic country like Norway or what that population or that view looks like from the borders of Finland and Russia. And so when we talk about that Arctic, we have to be very specific on how we define what the environmental uh, capacity is, what the environmental impacts are, what the people, what the population looks like, what's the industrial capabilities across that Arctic. When we talk about infrastructure or lack thereof in some communities, that may not translate well to some audiences. As we look at the, the infrastructure in, in northern Alaska or even much of North America, that infrastructure is very small, it's isolated, um, it's difficult to get to, there's no uh, capacity for road or rail to get there, so you're either approaching it from the air or from the Maritimes. And that's usually extremely seasonable. You take that to a highly developed community in northern Norway and you talk about those differences in the Arctic and it, and it, and it doesn't match point. Our job is to try to connect those across that enterprise. So bringing folks to a field exercise in, in northern Alaska or northern Canada, but at the same time taking those military folks, those governmental leaders, those community leaders, and getting them to see those other communities on the rest of the Arctic helps expand the concepts and the understanding of where we could potentially take that, that innovation, where we could take those technological advances, where we have a chance to, to cooperate uh, across the board. From a center's perspective, it, it goes back to the cooperative nature. As far as I'm concerned, we are better as a team. We are better as, as a unified effort. To me, that comes back to the importance of NATO. But more importantly, if we go back to Senator Stevens and Senator Anyway, 
completely different opposite ends of the spectrum. So one highly acclaimed Republican, one highly acclaimed Democrat, completely different approaches to, to economic values, to societal values, to socioeconomic values, but they could come to, together and actually come to an agreement on a number of issues. They are the driving force behind what we think our center is about. And it's one thing to say, hey, we're going to do a seminar or we're going to do an educational series or we're going to do some research from a particular vantage point. But our job is to get all the vantage points around the table um, supporting the education or supporting that research because that diversity of thought, that diversity of opinion helps manifest a greater understanding of what the actual challenges are. But more importantly, it drives to more thought out, well-defined and probably better funded uh, 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 staffing and uh, funding. So how does the Ted Stevens Center now influence uh, uh, security a a abroad, if you will, from, from a, a locally isolated, I'll call it elementary school from, from Anchorage, Alaska? Part of that is, is we draw on a robust pool of adjunct faculty members. So the center itself is only about 40 people. So we have 30 people permanent and, a, and about 12 to 15 contractors. So those 40 folks have connection to an adjunct faculty list of almost 2,000 people that now have a like-minded interest in the Arctic, shared interest in the Arctic, and through their passion and through their connections, we draw them in to, to deliver seminars, to deliver our coursework, to participate in panels and a number of those international forums. And that allows us as the center to bring some like-minded folks to the table, but also to bring a diverse approach to the solution set that needs to be, that, that we need to have to get after a number of those, those challenges in, in the high north. And you, when you specifically look across the Arctic, we can talk about a rules-based order. I'm glad UNCLOS was mentioned, IMO, governing body, Arctic Council. Any one of those won't have the right, or all the right tools, or all the right answers to help us govern that entire space. So allowing us uh, a, an opportunity to bring in uh, an entire set of, of individuals with unique perspectives, unique background, unique experiences uh, to develop those, to, to meet those challenges on the way ahead. You know, so for instance, Arctic Council in the past has been highly successful at challenging some of the environmental impacts to the Arctic, uh, including some search and rescue, including some prevention capabilities. But when it started to talk about security or defense, it stops. So what's the avenue to have those conversations about security or defense in the Arctic as we look to the space as being more competitive? I, I won't say it's contested, but with increased activity, increased desires for the pursuits of, of minerals, uh, uh, oil and gas, perhaps uh, the, the marine affairs as, as most of those fish species, fish stocks, are actually migrating north to, to follow that colder water, that's gonna concentrate all those protein sources in a very small space. Bring all those assets together, that's gonna create competition, that's gonna create a rub. So what formats can we generate to have those conversations to keep that, that competition at its, at its best, to keep that competition friendly, to keep that competition uh, uh, peaceful, um, requires avenues like the, the Arctic Coast Guard Forum, uh, the Arctic Security Forces Roundtable and the like that allows you to have those conversations with not only industry leaders, but with defense leaders and security professionals, security practitioners that operate in that space on a regular, on a, on a regular, uh, more informed basis. Um, it becomes a challenge uh, when you try to walk through that entire space and you, and you have one country, half of the Arctic now excluded from those conversations. That's, that's difficult. Um, Rightfully, I think so, because of the, the actions that Russia took to invade, invade Ukraine, there are, there are some accountability for that, and they are being held accountable, I'll, I'll call it, on the world stage, if you will. How long will that, that press forward? We're, what, two years into it now? What's the future look like? I, I mean, there's, there are a number of scholarly experts that, that have an opinion as to how long that's going to go. Some say very short. Well, that's what they said last year. Um, some say very long. Well, two years isn't long at all. So how much longer can we go? Well, that's that's a big question into the larger uh, uh, mechanics of understanding Russia, Russia dynamics and the thought processes from from Putin and and, and below. 
when you look at the land campaign in, in Ukraine. That's one aspect of it. But then the other components of the military, the, the Air Force side of the house, and certainly their maritime assets um, are, are basically untouched. Um, so how does that influences or how does that influence Russia's dynamics in ensuring a peaceful and prosperous Arctic continues? Uh, so, so from my perspective, prior Coast Guard work, to me, there's, there's a dichotomy of two Russias. And, and part of that is, is in my operations in the Bering Sea, so I had a cooperative relationship with Russia. Um, so U.S. Coast Guard actions to Russia and FSB, so common patrol area, common boundary, so efforts like search and rescue, uh, law enforcement, fisheries enforcement, fisheries regulation, uh, sovereignty issues along that established, well-established maritime boundary line between those countries, uh, we could work through that. I had an operations center that I could call and talk to my counterpart and vice versa. So if we had a case come up, you know, a fishing vessel was on the wrong side of the line or appeared to be taking too much catch or cooperating with an international for, off, uh, for another ship doing an, uh, an illegal offload of that shipment, we could cooperate and talk side by side. Those conversations today are still going, but the important facts of that, of, of in-person meetings, command center to command center interactions, one team going to another country, those have stopped. Well, how do we expect to advance, you know, the search and rescue exercise or advance the next pollution exercise or advance the next cooperative joint patrol of this enforceable boundary between those two countries? Uh, doesn't exist today. However, they still maintain a rules-based order. They follow the, the, the international rules of transit through the maritime boundary line or through the international strait because that, that feeds that, that nearly 20% of their domestic product of moving product out of LNG or LNG out of Yamal south to Asian markets. So generating that money, that dollar, is important to them. So they're going to abide by those rules. Well, the same Russia is now... I'll call it antagonistic in the, in the North Atlantic, towards Finland, towards Russia, is, you know, invaded a sovereign country in Ukraine. That's the same Russia that is trying to be peaceful and mindful in, in the Bering Sea, asking you to, oh, well, let's ignore this over here. We're playing by the rules over here, yet, yet they won't over here. How do you, how do you cooperate um, with a country that is, I'll call it, bipolar in that nature? Um, that, that effort falls, you know, tremendous weight upon administrations across the countries, uh, to you know, for the U.S. to our State Department, and and that requires incredible efforts to engage in those conversations with a with a country that seems to be going in, in two different directions at, at once. Um, I, I wish I could you know forecast what the end state looks like, um, and and as as I can, I think you started out. It, it's going to go one of two ways. It's going to go really bad for Ukraine or really bad for Russia. Either of those two outcomes is going to impact the world at large. Whether that's from a human security perspective, whether that's food security, uh, maritime security, uh, uh, sovereignty issues across those host nations, or increasing those, you know, those chances of, of a larger miscalculation that now gets into, you know, full scale, uh, you know, efforts, you know, war, conflict between other nations beyond Ukraine and the United States. So, or between Ukraine and Russia. So that's kind of gives you a, a, an operational perspective of how I approach what this, this space looks like uh, from a security perspective. And, and, and notice when I talk security perspective, defense doesn't even come up into the conversation when you talk about all those aspects of human security. You know, when, when you talk about uh, uh, protection of, of coastal infrastructure, when you talk about the influence or the confines of, of what these dynamic weather systems are doing to, to coastal communities. When you talk about the, the impacts, whether that's severe flooding or significant drought, in areas that were fairly stable for the past past 50 years, or you talk about subsistence uh, obligations for not only those coastal communities, but how that infects those larger protein stocks um, uh, in the northern in the northern waters. I mean, look at the large distant water fishing fleets uh, that that are that are imperiling you know countries like like Africa and South America. How does that look, or what does that look like when when that same competition for those protein stocks now migrates to the higher the higher north? All of those are security issues, will likely lead to defense issues if we don't address those up front. Uh, so with that, I think I'd like to offer it up to some questions and answers. I know I'm probably a little early, but I'd rather get to questions that you have for me, and, and I can provide you answers for those versus me just talking and talking and talking.
Thank you, Matthew. Do we have any questions here? Fuck. So, no? Yeah. Is it you? Yeah. So. Thank you for, for your lecture. I want to start with you giving your experience and uh, uh, extensive experience from, from the US Coast Guard. You mentioned uh, search and rescue um, and, and, and uh, you know, I, I, I want to ask you if you could elaborate a bit more on that, how could, how could um, uh, that develop this place into all the, you know, increased activities in, in the Arctic um, from a military per perspective, but also, uh, you know, the, the civil traffic, the, the commercial traffic. And, and how could you, uh, how would you foresee, you know, us cooperating together yeah. in, on, in, that, in, the, in, in that sector? Yeah, th thanks. It's a, it's a great question. Uh, so so from, my, from my Coast Guard background, Search and rescue comes from, from two aspects, um, prevention and response. So on prevention it is formated by, uh, by, by regulations, by inspections, by communications to not only the, the industrial applications that are out there, but the, civ the civil applications of operating on the, uh, uh, in the maritime environment, operating on the high seas. So those prevention efforts um, can, can technically be costly because the return on that investment is, is not ve measured very well. So, so if you go to, say, for instance, a fishing fleet, and, and you talk about in, in inspections of their survival gear or their survival equipment, um, well, that gets pretty costly to do that in every single community where there are, are, are commercial fishing vessels or even recreational fishing vessels. So to do that across the breadth, um, can be, besides the, the, the funding to get there, well, now you've got to train a workforce to be able to do that. Um, and, and most, uh, I'll call it budgetary systems, that preventive work, if you don't show an immediate return on it, is usually the first thing cut, which then leads to the response assets that now have to respond to a, a, to a fishing vessel, to a commercial vessel that is now in distress. Had they had the proper training, had they had the proper certifications, had they had the proper equipment on board, the, the response asset would, would technically never be, never be required. But as things come up, you must be prepared to respond uh, all the time. Well, how do you respond to all threats and all hazards with a small, with a small force? Well, that, that allows, that forces you to, 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 to manage the, the area through a response center. So on, on the U.S. side of the house, we have regional response centers, uh, regional search and rescue coordination centers that continue to monitor the area, track the traffic, watch the storms, watch those high peak seasons where there's lots of traffic. Um, you know, and as you equate this back to the Arctic, our, our, our activity here is only increasing. You know, that's commercial traffic through, through oil and gas shipping, industrial applications, uh, resource extraction, uh, both on, on the mineral side, but also the, uh, the fishery side. Uh, but then there's increase in, in um, ecotourism and cruise ships are, are, are filling that space up. If it's not being proactive and managed from a central location, it's difficult to place your assets where you think you're going to need them at, 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 to the most degree. Uh, part of that is a cooperative effort that's now going to be required by all those nations that operate in that area. So, so on the U.S. side, uh, regularly, U.S. Canadian Coast Guard work together regularly. U.S., Canadian, Greenlandic Coast Guard work together regularly. Uh, I'd like to say that was the same from the U.S. to the Iceland Coast Guard. It's a distance. We're getting better at that. Uh, Coast Guard Cutter Healy was just here this past, past October on its way back from the Arctic. Well, that interaction, that cooperative exchange of, of best practices, uh, call it officer exchanges, but how to best operate in that region, in that zone, can be best communicated through, one of the, through, a, through a central location. Through, through a central facility. That becomes key on minimizing uh, the impacts of, of poor prevention or limited prevention, because you can't, you can't, as I said, you can't be a, a affecting all hazards at all places at the same time. So, so you establish that requirement in your response assets to, to be able to preposition to get to the, the, the most extreme cases of, of loss of vessel, uh, uh, oil pollution, or, or contaminants in, in that region but you can only do that cooperating across across the boundaries. 
um, especially when you end up with peak demands on, I'll call it being pulled in two directions. Um, uh, so we have cooperative agreements and arrangements with a number of countries that, that will do a joint boarding or a joint patrol with their ship, but at the same time, will we'll allow their officers to act on behalf of the U.S. Coast Guard for, for an inspection or for an investigation. That cooperative effort can only be accomplished by those, by those services working together through a, through a common operation center um, and efforts that can coordinate those not only in advance, but also do the follow-on actions. It's one thing to say, hey, we're going to coordinate those actions, but the, the fisheries enforcement or the boarding action or the search and rescue case then needs to be evaluated by all the parties to take those lessons learned to help influence what the next round of activity is. So those joint operations, that joint patrol becomes much more effective in the long term. Yeah, thanks. Great, great question. He's going to run all the way up there at the top. Yeah, but I'm <laughs> sure. You better? Yeah. Thank you. Uh, thanks for a very interesting lecture. Um, I've got a, a twofold question with regards to, firstly, Iceland's current role uh, in terms of search and rescue and the uh, NATO cooperation. How do you see it uh, as it is currently? And the, secondly, how do you see it uh, develop in view of uh, the increased threats to the Arctic flank of NATO? So, so relevancy, it's, it's, it's absolutely relevant. When, when you talk about the North Atlantic uh, bridge, that North Atlantic connection, you can walk from, from Canada to Greenland to Iceland to Norway. The importance of the North Atlantic maritime routes, whether that's for commercial traffic or military traffic, is key uh, to, to understanding that the maritime demands and needs uh, across that, that Atlantic. From an Arctic perspective, all that traffic is going north to the Arctic and has to return. Um, from a commercial aspect, that's continuing to develop. But from a military aspect, you can look at the, the strategic position for where the Russian assets are. Um, and want to come through the, 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 the NATO requirements to monitor, track, and, and follow those, and, and I'll call it keep accountable to those, is key upon what that communications looks like across the, the North Atlantic. That, that NATO alliance allows those communication, that communications to flow more readily, especially with Sweden and Finland now joining that, those ranks. That's just going to be in a communications across that front. I mean, NATO is defensive in posture. Uh, yes, Iceland doesn't have a standing military, but the information, the, the key of operating, the, the, the knowledge that they have in this region can, can only help influence that, that NATO domain awareness, if you will, with that, with that improved communications. Are the demands going to increase over time? A absolutely. Um, would, would there be a call for you know, further development in Iceland? I, I certainly could see that, but from a budgetary perspective, whether it's Iceland's budgets or the U.S. budget or NATO budget overall, we're, we're not going to get there. So how do we best cooperate to take advantage of, the, of, of that collaborative nature already inside NATO? So continue to do those joint operations, continue to do uh, the, the joint sharing of information. And so cooperate, not, not just in passing the information, but, but approach it from, from a whole of government perspective. So when, when the next naval flotilla comes through, U.S. naval flotilla comes through, if they just pass by Iceland and not stop, interact, do some joint operations training with, with the Icelandic Coast Guard, that's a missed opportunity. If we don't work on the communications from ship to ship, and not ship the command center, but ship the ship, let the two captains talk, um, that's a missed opportunity. Uh, when we talk about transatlantic military flights, you know, whether it's, whether it's air refueling or, or military transport, if we're not stopping, taking advantage of the resources that are here to get familiar with the territory, uh, learn how to operate in this environment, uh, they cancel my flight. I mean, this morning's flight at 7 a.m. was canceled yesterday at noon. That advanced norm warning is, is tremendously valuable, not just for the civil sector, but for the military operators. But if they don't come and if they don't cooperate and, and, and joint operate, they'll never know that. And, and so to me, uh, Iceland is key to that, that transatlantic NATO bridge a, across, the, uh, you know, across this small neck of water, if, if you will. Um, so that cooperative effort, I think, is only going to, is only going to increase. As we kind of heard earlier, you know, the cooperative efforts on the Air Forces between Norway, Sweden, and Finland is, is only improving. And under NATO, that's going to continue to improve. And now we'll incorporate, you know, fifth-gen fighters into that cooperative effort. Well, what does that look like when they try to push to the West? Uh, sorry, most of those folks, they get over water, 
And I mean, that kind of gets back to your question. What's that search and rescue capability? What's that recovery of those down pilots requirements? All of those pilots are saying, hey, I, I, I've got a really good solid aircraft, but if I got to eject, I want, I, want, I want to be able to get recovered and get returned. That's a cooperative effort you know, across the NATO spectrum. And that's going to continue to develop as there's more maritime aircraft, there's more uh, uh, ships coming through the region, when there's that more competitive space. And, and, and I have to say, what, you know, you, you put those, those folks in the same airspace or in the same water space, mistakes happen, accidents happen. Well, how do, how do we best mitigate that? Well, that's going to require cooperation by the folks that already live there, that already work there. That kind of gets back to your how well can, can Iceland support, you know, those efforts of NATO. It's a really good question. You have to throw it. It's just not the same if you just pass yeah. it. Thank you very much for the overview. I really appreciate it. Uh, I have a question concerning uh, indigenous people. You mentioned the three pillars the Ted Stevens Center is focusing, yeah. uh, and also the focus on the localities, on the uh, inclusion of indigenous people. They are in the location, very much present. Uh, what is the role, and especially how do you involve this in your uh, uh, institute's uh, center strategy, but also the role in the national strategy yep. uh, in terms of founding and in terms of research? Yeah, so, so very Thank good you. question. And, and since the center stood up, um, it, it, indigenous people's perspective has been key to, to, to our values and, 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 and our efforts, to our mission. So on my staff, we have, you know, technically three folks that are that are indigenous Alaska uh, and, and so not only share their personal experiences and, and their personal perspectives through their work, but they're already connected with that circumpolar indigenous population. So so we have folks that we're already connected with through our indigenous peoples, not only in our staff, but the connections that we make, whether it's through Chihutka, you know, northeast Russia to the uh, Inuits across northern Alaska through northern Canada. To, to Sami people in, you know, from, from Greenland to, to Norway, to, even to, to Finland. And so cooperative efforts or, or allow us to, to weave in that indigenous perspectives in, in all my coursework. So every course that I have, there's a specific module that, that provides an opportunity for an indigenous people's perspective. So how does that influence local rules, uh, community rules, state rules, national rules, uh, and, and how are those, uh, how do those perhaps influence, you know, a positional power that they have or, or not? I mean, the, you know, indigenous peoples have been permanent participants for Arctic Council, you know, since its inception, but they don't get a vote. So, so, that, so we're, we're trying to help influence, well, they're there, well, let's get that voice heard. How do we make it more recognizable? And, then, and that's also contributing to the other two pillars from a research perspective. Um, we have a number of projects that are looking at how does this this human security aspect, this, this indigenous knowledge that's now thousands of years old, help influence or help validate you know, today's science, if you will. And, and so it's interesting. I, I've seen science folks come from the lower 48 in the US to an indigenous community uh, without seeking permission, without talking to them. And after three years worth of research, they'll try to produce a paper and, and yet they could have gone and probably got the same information from, 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 a, lo from, a, from a local elder uh, in, in about an hour's conversation because they've been watching it, you know, since, since before, before time began. And so, so that that's helps feed that information not only to the community itself, but also gives them recognition for, for that intellectual knowledge that they already have. And then from an engagement perspective, um, from activities from an indigenous people's panel here at Arctic Circle Assemble, Assembly to we're doing a uh, uh, indigenous people's focus on gender equality. Uh, one of my professors is actually traveling to Mongolia here later this spring to present that, that picture from an indigenous perspective uh, on what that looks like to try to survive and thrive in the Arctic. And, and for them, it's interesting. I mean, I'll talk about the harsh environment and, and they call it home. Um, so to providing that venue, providing that speaking opportunity is, is, is a, one of our main pillars to, to, try to, to weave that across all uh, the perspectives. And, and, and I won't throw the U.S. government under the bus, but our relationship with, with some of those indigenous populations has not been all that rosy in the past. I mean, we could talk about colonialism and what that looks like across the world, but now providing an opportunity for their voices to be heard, for them to be able to speak out, that, that's part of our mission. And heck, we might actually learn a thing or two from them. And, and vice versa. 
So thanks. Yeah, great, great, great question. Um, well, this is a kind of a follow-up question, you could okay. say. So thank you, Matthew, for a very informative um, presentation. First, I was very glad to hear that Ted Stevens Center uh, includes human security in their concerns. Um, and it's, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's interesting to hear how strong a relationship you seem to have developed with indigenous communities. Now, given the somewhat still muted activity of the Arctic Council. Uh, Njord mentioned that there are some projects that have started again, and this is true, but my understanding is that there is still very limited um, cooperation with Russian scientists, which means that we're missing data from half of the region. Correct. Now, given your relationship also with uh, indigenous communities and your knowledge of the dynamics of the region and the climate change, etc. Could you share insight on the impact that the Arctic Council pause in activities has had on local and indigenous communities, uh, including perhaps in Siberia or Russia? Yeah, so, so it's a good, so that's, it's a very good question. And, and up front, the impacts to Siberia, to Northeast Russia, I, it's, that's not my expertise. I, I have some staff members that I could, if, if I brought them with, I could point them out and they could, they could help that. So some of them are connected by, by family linkages, family connections, and, and so they, they talk daily. Um, but, but from a scientific aspect, you know, the position of the U.S. government was, hey, we're, we're not going to do that right now. I think we're seeing some movement change. Um, uh, so to put Arctic Council on a pause, uh, uh, pause maybe is not even the best word, stop. I mean, it, all work stopped. Okay, maybe there was some, some uh, you know, activity, some research that was still going on, but at the ministerial level, it was not occurring. As, as one of the most, I'll call it, well-known and probably successful governance bodies, Arctic Council was very, very effective, especially bringing out, the, you know, the influence of, of climate change on the region, the influence on the peoples. I think that was incredibly valuable. Well, well that all stopped, you know, two years ago, and now we're not doing that. Some of that's coming back, but again, no, no full cooperative ministerial work is going, so some of those efforts that the products that are coming out of that research or the products that's coming out of that cooperation is not is not not floating up so would we see a new agreement on on prevention of oil spills you know following up on the uh, imo polar code on, on what are we going to do with you know double hull tankers that are operating in the space that 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 ministerial level those outputs aren't going to happen anytime soon and you could probably confirm that with with the recent chairship has has modified and changed uh, they're going to try to get there but still, it requires Russia to participate. We, we may be able to get there in the future, but that's going to be up to Russia with their actions, with their actions in Ukraine. Um, I think one of the, the downfalls, especially from a, an indigenous people's perspective with Arctic Council uh, taking a pause, is most of the, in, the indigenous peoples were permanent participants. So they were at those conversations. They were involved in that research. They were involved in the development of those, po those policy pieces. Um, when it came to having a vote, they, they, they didn't have one, as I said, but at least their voices could be heard. They could offer up a position. That has stopped. So there's no, there's no unique formal uh, uh, venue or arena for the, for the indigenous peoples to have that, that voice right now. I mean, there's still international cooperation through ICC, you know, Inu Inuit Circle Polar Council and the like that they still have a voice, um, but, but doesn't really influence that governance structure as, as Arctic Council was, was connected to in the past. Does that, make, does that make sense? Thanks. Thank you, Matthew. Uh, I have a few questions from the participants online. Great. Uh, from Sanat, the question is, in the coming decades, do you view the feasibility of implementing environmentally sustainable practices in military operations within the Arctic as realistic? So it's realistic. So yeah. I guess we could define realistic, but I would say yes. Uh, and so it, it's interesting. So my line of work, so I'm a chemist by, by education, right? And, and so I find it very interesting, and I'm going to use two extremes. Um, so you'll have an environmental activist on this one, on one side, that wants to reduce carbon emissions, right? Reduce that, that carbon footprint across the world, especially in the Arctic, because it's so impactful there. Um, and yet we'll look at the, the military as the largest dinosaur killing entity in the world. Uh, rightfully so, I, I understand that connection. So they won't talk to them because they're, they're the bad folks. And then you'll have folks on the military side of the house that are, that are by, by congressional mandate, 
have to improve their energy efficiency. It, it, it's a budget mechanics. The, 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 the availability of, of those fossil fuels, if you will, are, are, are going to be diminishing, are going to reduce. And if, and if you're going to improve your asset resiliency, your capabilities, you're going to have to innovate and find other alternative sources. Um, so the Defense Department is doing that. They're, they're looking as, uh, from one extreme to, you know, looking from synthetic aviation fuels to small micro, you know, nuclear reactors. And what does that look like from an expeditionary standpoint? You know, on one side of the argument, Defense Department is doing that work, but they'll look at the environmental activists and go, oh, we can't, we can't talk there because we're, we're approaching it from two different norms. The Ted Stevens Center is trying to get those, those entities to sit around the table to have that same conversation because we're all in the same pursuits, right? It, it, it's about countering the action of, of climate change, reducing that impacts on the world at large. I, I think we're going to come at it from a different perspective, but the end results, we're looking to do the same. Uh, you could talk about, you know, an SMMR or an, or an MMR, uh, on one side and, 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 and the environmental side is, oh, we can't do that because that, that's really bad. Okay, and yes, I've seen, you know, reports from Chernobyl and Three Mile Island, Fukushima, and, and yes, some parts of that nuclear energy are, 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 are hazardous, but you can look at the, the confines of France and how productive and how successful, how safely those programs have run, yet that doesn't enter the narrative between the, the two sides. So how do you have that diverse approach to a very complex problem and getting those folks to sit around the table. That's, that's, what, our, that's what the center is trying to do uh, across the board, to have those conversations. I'd say like-minded, the end results is where we're trying to get to. Our methodology for getting there may be just a little bit, a little bit different. Our job is to try to sync those and, and allow those, those voices to come together, have that conversation. Yeah, thanks. Then I have one more question from the, the chat as well. So we discussed a lot about the Arctic, obviously, but uh, what about non-Arctic countries like Portugal, for example, considering progressive and growing traffic uh, in the Arctic North Atlantic, is maritime security at risk, a risk that applies to NATO? Yes, yeah, so, so, that, so that's a really good question. And so uh, because, because the way our center was founded, it, it, it's on Ar Arctic nations. I mean, that's our primary outreach is, is to, the, to the Arctic nations themselves. But at the same time, that outreach goes to allies and partners because as they say, what happens to the Arctic doesn't stay in the Arctic. So whether that affects the world, you know, cooling mechanism from that or the, the, the effects that it has on, on the protein, the, the, the fish stocks that are migrating north, to what that looks to do for, you know, underwater movement of cold water streams and what that looks like for, for uh, ocean acidification and the like, all of that is going to influence, you know, the, the rest of the world. I mean, look at the mid-latitudes. Their largest concern stems from the Arctic when you look at global sea rise. On, on what happens down the road. Well, those conversations need to happen across the board. Um, and it, but it's one thing to, to come to to come to Iceland to talk about the Arctic because it's 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 right there, right? Did I get the direction right? That's pretty close. But so it's right there. But but if you go to Central Europe, if if you go to to Italy or, or northern part of Africa, when they when you talk about Arctic, they're like, yeah, that that's that's a that's a long way away. But it has a direct impact on their livelihood today. And so involving them in that conversation, we'll, we'll actually be in Garmisch, Germany in May to have a dialogue on, on Arctic security. But we're going to do an introduction to, to the topography, the geography, the, the peoples, the governance structure in the Arctic to 68 countries that, that aren't even near the Arctic. So in getting them to be Arctic aware, to have understanding of what the impacts of that environment do uh, to the region. That helps NATO's perspective, um, understanding the impacts of the changes ongoing in the Arctic climate perspective, but also the relationship that NATO has, you know, with its, you know, with its border, you know, Russia, for instance, on what does that, that environment look like from a stability perspective? How does that influence, you know, EU security? How does that in, uh, impact NATO security? Uh, all that needs to be communicated. So everybody starts with a, a fresh understanding of how do we define this space of the Arctic? And when you look at the increasing activity that's moving north and south, you know, the world is connected via the Maritimes. And, and so when you first talk about the impacts that, that drought conditions have taken on, on the Suez Canal, drought conditions have taken on the Panama Canal, now, now it's quick, you'll see the headlines, oh, it's going to be across the top of the world. Eh, probably not today, probably not next week, probably not for a few years because of the ice conditions that are going to be there. Um, well, well, that's a very dynamic environment. If we are going to operate in, in that space, um, and continue to increase that, that level of traffic, that goes back to the very first question on, well, what's, what's the, the presence, whether that's search and rescue, regulatory, 
uh, uh, response assets that are going to have to govern that, that space as that activity continues to increase. You increase the activity, increases the competition, well, it increases the rub, the friction, whether it's, you know, uh, company against company or nation against nation. Well, having the right assets in there will keep that minimized to the, to the best of its ability. And I think that's where NATO comes in into that role. The, the challenge for NATO will be large enterprise, 31, right, 32 countries. Um, and, and that's for this entire uh, defense of, of Europe, if you will, versus this, this micro focus on, on, a, on a small region, the Arctic. Important to me, as, as that's living near there, um, but from a, from a NATO perspective, that's only a small piece of the entire the entire piece uh, entire pledge, if you will. Um, so focusing that conversation across to everybody, so they understanding what those dynamics are that are occurring up north, that those high latitude influences, how does that influence the mid latitude sections, is part of that communications that NATO is working on. Charge now, yeah. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, round of applause for Matthew. So, thank you. Yes. Thanks. Thanks. Thank you so much for the, the lecture. You. Appreciate it. Now we're going to take a bit of a recep, uh, like bit of recess. So we're going to take 10 minutes uh, at break. We're going to be back here at uh, 1445. Uh, you can help yourself to some water and some coffee that is just by the entrance. So yes, and then we'll be back for uh, Rasmus's presentation. Thank you.
Well, sorry about that. Thank you, everyone, for an excellent discussion so far. I would just like to uh, introduce. I don't know where this is coming from. There you go. Um, I would just like to uh, introduce finally our very own Rasmus Bertelsen, who will be participating, as you can see, online. Uh, Rasmus is a professor of uh, Northern Studies and is the Barnes Chair in Politics at the Arctic University of Norway in Tromsø. And he's also the former Nansen Professor of Arctic Studies here at the University of Akureyri. Um, Nansen, you have the floor. Uh, Rasmus, you have the floor. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, can you see and hear me? Frederick, uh, can you see and hear me? It's loud and clear. Good. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, very. Thank you very much for the invitation. I'm very sorry I can't uh, be there with you. And um, there was a question. Uh, there was a question about um, about Svalbard, and I'm actually sitting in Longyearbyen in Svalbard. So while uh, Nord and um, Njord and the Matt are sitting there in the sweet south with daylight and everything, uh, pretending to be Arctic. I mean, I'm sitting here in the polar night with polar bears roaming outside my window. Um, so, um, so thank you very much for the invitation uh, to be here and um, to join you. And uh, I'm very happy to add my uh, observations uh, to... Um, to what has already uh, been said, um, and uh, I, so that we can uh, be on time, uh, I'll be as uh, quick as I can. And um, what I want to talk about is the Arctic in a larger world order, and it perhaps uh, follows more what um, what Newt was talking about. Uh, and you can see here the title I proposed, uh, a NATO BRICS divided Arcto Arctic in a NATO BRICS divided world. Or the subtitle, why the Arctic never was and nor ever will be exceptional. Um, so what I want to talk about um, and uh, hopefully have time for a question or two is that... Um, I'll introduce myself briefly, and then uh, I will briefly outline how the Arctic uh, historically and today, and I think in the future, is uh, closely integrated into international order and reflects international order. And that means that if we know international order, we also know uh, something about how the Arctic looks and how the Arctic develops. So uh, we had Cold War bipolarity also in the Arctic. Then we had post-Cold War U.S. unipolarity hegemony, which is the basis of the Arctic we have now. And then that post-Cold War order is uh, coming to an end. We see signs of Sino-American bipolarity. And of course, uh, Russia is striving for multipolarity, as Russia has been very clear about since the 1990s. Uh, global uh, order is changing. It's changing in economics, it's changing in science and technology, and it's changing in legitimacy. And that is all shaping the background for, um, for Arctic order. And uh, what we see as a response to, um, to these changes to world order, it's a Sino-Russian Western decoupling in the Arctic uh, and in general. Um, and finally, uh, a few conclusions, a few uh, remarks about the future of uh, global governance uh, in general and concerning the Arctic. Uh, I trust that you can see my screen. Well, yeah, I good. Uh, let me first uh, briefly introduce myself. Uh, I am a Danish national born in Denmark, uh, but as you can see, I lived as a child in, in Iceland, in Reykjavik, and I also studied in Iceland a couple of years. So I speak uh, reasonable Icelandic, and uh, Iceland is in many ways uh, home to me. And uh, I was extremely happy to be Nansen Professor at University of Akureyri in 2022 and 2023. It was, uh, I felt very much at home. 
Uh, this line of pictures, it's of course me on an Icelandic horse sometime in the 1980s. Many of the Icelandic audience will recognize Vilborg Dávjarsdóttir, the uh, important Icelandic uh, poet, um, who was uh, one of my uh, very important teachers in Österbarskol in, uh, in Reykjavík in the mid-1980s. Um, Wilborg, uh, who uh, made a big uh, influence on me, and uh, I just mentioned here that um, um, that uh, Icelandic school teachers are very poorly paid, and they often have several jobs. And uh, Wilborg also uh, taught Icelandic both in the Chinese and Soviet embassies in Reykjavik, and. Uh, the observations of uh, from inside those embassies she shared with me, for example, at the last years of the Chinese Cultural Revolution, uh, to uh, me, it really showed the importance of uh, engaging the other side very closely to have a very deep insight into the other side. Of course, the picture is in the middle is the old gymnasium in Reykjavik, which the Icelanders will know well, you recognize the then president of Iceland, Oliver Ragnar Grimson, and me in 96. Um, and of course, uh, the last picture is from the opening of the China-Iceland Arctic Observatory at Karhok in October 2018. And the uh, Chinese gentleman is, of course, uh, then uh, Director General of the Polar Research Institute of China, Dr. Yang Huygen. So in many ways, there's a direct line from the boy on the horse uh, to the last picture. And um, um, as I say, Iceland is very much home to me. And uh, I have been very, very much inspired by the Icelandic uh, tradition of travel for education, travel for experience, what in Icelandic is called a sikla to sail. Uh, I have the opportunity to regularly teach in China and uh, collaborate on research. Um, there's a Chinese term, uh, my very poor pronunciation would be haigui, um, which is a Chinese wordplay, sea turtles, uh, Chinese who have gone abroad and returned, and uh, they have shaped uh, Chinese society very much for the last more than 100 years. Uh, there's also another saying that goes something like, it's uh, better it's, or it's as good to travel 10,000 miles as to read 10,000 books. Uh, I appreciate the, that thinking very much. Uh, I don't know similar sayings in Danish or Norwegian, but I always encourage students to travel as much as they possibly can. And while I have been making these remarks, you, you may have quickly run through uh, my personal uh, background for, um, for, yes, for what is my background. So um, the Arctic in international order so in the Cold War, we had a bipolar system because we had two superpowers. And therefore, we had a realist order. Now, that system was not globalized. It was very little integrated. So these two powers only had to concern themselves with nuclear arms control. The West had its bounded order with the organizations I mentioned, which were also present in the Nordic, North American Arctic, and the Soviet Union had its organization, and we, of course, had the Soviet Arctic. So we had uh, the Arctic clearly reflecting um, the international order. Then the United States wins the, so the Cold War, and the Soviet Union uh, loses the Cold War, leading to the dissolution of the Soviet Union in 91, Christmas 91, and a very, very deep crisis of Russian society. I think the estimation is that uh, Russian society contracted something like 30-40% economically at the uh, dissolution of the Soviet Union. So then we had a unipolar order with the United States as the single uh, liberal uh, superpower, and therefore we had a liberal order. Various uh, Western institutions, they either became global or expanded, 
And that was the basis of what I would call the circumpolar liberal Arctic order. Circumpolar, because it included Russia, liberal, not in the political sense, but in the international relations, uh, theoretical sense, of concerning itself with liberal topics as science, environment, indigenous people, people to people cooperation, and not state security, that's a realist order. And of course, that was the basis for these organizations that we saw from the 1990s, the Arctic Council, the International Arctic Science Committee, the Barnes Euro Arctic Council, the Bering Corporation, etc. And we in the West, some people had very strong uh, expectations and hopes that that was the end of history. Uh, We had won the Cold War and that was supposed to be the end of history. Instead of the end of history, we had the return of history and we had the return of the rest as opposed to the West. Um, And if we look at the demographics, you can see the circle saying there are more people living inside this circle than outside of it. If you see the uh, table to the um, to the right from the Asian Development Bank, and of course the world economy today is much almost infinitely larger than in the 1700s. But you see that up to the 1700s, 1800s, Asia—that's not China alone; it's Asia, including the Indian subcontinent, etc.—was more than half of world economic activity. That contracts very much with Western dominance. And remember, these are relative figures. Um, But according to these predictions, uh, Asia will represent more than half of world economic output again in 2050. So um, as I tell my Nordic students, uh, they they will spend their careers in a world that becomes less familiar And as I remark to my Chinese students, that they are perhaps spending their career in a world that becomes more familiar. We see um, we see this data very quickly. That you can see in '95, of course, the G7 was a much larger share of the world economy than the uh, BRICS countries. And today, and that is before the expansion of the BRICS bloc. they are a larger part of the world economy uh, in terms of purchasing power parity. You see here, if we look at it per capita, then of course the G7 countries are much, much wealthier, but because the uh, the BRICS countries have much larger populations, as they become wealthier per capita, then of course the effects, uh, the uh, relative global effect will be very, very strong. This uh, change in world order is also in uh, science and technology and knowledge. This is uh, science and engineering papers, and this is American data. You have the high income uh, economies, well, they grow, but of course, the very strong growth in science and engineering papers is from the upper middle income economies, which are largely the BRICS economies. Um, if we see at it in more detail um, here on, on this side here, you can see that the green is China. You see a strong growth there. The blue is the United States. It's very stable. And of course, uh, uh, countries like the United Kingdom, uh, Japan, Germany, it's very stable. Uh, we also see it here. It's not a, just a question of quantity. It's also a question of quality that here, articles in the top 1% most cited journal, uh, journal articles, where uh, we see stability for the United States. We do see some European growth, which is good. But of course, we see strong uh, Chinese and Indian growth. And we also have uh, a global change in terms of legitimacy. So global order both rests on the relative distribution of material power, but global order also rests on legitimacy. And there, um, I don't think there's any doubt that we in the West have largely overestimated our legitimacy and our credibility in the rest of the world. 
but now with the um, with the violence we see in Gaza right now and the proceedings we see at the International Court of Justice and the International Criminal Court initiated by countries of South Africa, Mexico, Chile, Indonesia, uh, which have, are, of course, exactly these uh, BRICS-style countries, uh, we see a very marked shift in global legitimacy. So that is to, how to say, uh, put the... Um, um the the how to say the, the the global picture and there uh so um american unipolarity after the cold war was also the basis of globalization and now of course we are seeing a kind of retrenchment of that globalization we have been talking myself a lot about the global arctic and are we going to see a post global arctic so there, uh, now, if we look at the world's two largest national economies by far, which are, of course, the United States and the People's Republic of China, if we look at the world's two largest science and technology systems, they are also by far the United States and the People's Republic of China. So in that respect, we have bipolarity. And then the theoretical uh, prediction will be that we see that these competing uh, superpowers will form orders, so-called bounded orders, uh, to uh, harness the resources of their allies and also to, to discipline their allies. Uh, and then, of course, of special concern for the Arctic, the question is, and this was already an evident question before the Russian full-scale invasion of Ukraine almost two years ago, uh, the question would, of course, be where would Russia fall between the American-led order and the Chinese-led order? And, of course, the war in Ukraine uh, clearly answers that question. Um, before that war, well, if Russia had fallen in a... Western-led order, we would have had a circumpolar Arctic. And now we very much have uh, this Arctic, which is divided between the uh, uh, US-led uh, NATO Arctic, and Sweden is, for all practical purposes, uh, a member of NATO. Uh, so on the one side, we have the Arctic 7, NATO states, clear American leadership, and on the other side, we have Russia, and of course, Russia turns all it can economically, scientifically, technologically to the BRICS. So um, I want to uh, leave sufficient time for questions. So, um, so I'm being efficient in my presentation. Uh, one way to look at the international system today and international politics, I think, a lot in international politics today is driven by this triangle uh, between the United States, China, and Russia. And of course, uh, we have marked conflicts between the United States and China uh, that concern uh, not least Taiwan and the South China Sea. Uh, in Russia, between the United States and Russia, we of course have uh, the Ukraine war. And these very poor relations between the United States and China and the United States and Russia, they, of course, affect the third side of this triangle where uh, China and, the, uh, and Russia, they uh, lean on each other for matters of energy, minerals, food, strategic technologies, uh, space questions, early warning technology, missile defense technology. And then if we look at the rest of the world, what the uh, BRICS plus countries, but also what is called the mint countries, Mexico, Indonesia, Nigeria, Turkey, the Gulf Corporation Council countries. Well, of course, uh, they have uh, all kinds of uh, strong relations with the United States, but they also have with China. And of course, they keep so with Russia we see very clearly the voting in the United Nations Security Council, the United Nations General Assembly. Uh, we see the diverging views on the war in Ukraine and now with the uh, violence in Gaza, 
uh, the voting at the United Nations uh, shows quite clearly this world divided between what I would call a NATO plus world. So NATO plus Australia, New Zealand, to some extent, Japan and South Korea and the rest. And where do we have Europe and the Nordics and the Arctic in that? Well, I think we have to say we have them up there in the corner. And of course, we have a very strong transatlantic relationship. Uh, but we also have um, very clear American uh, leadership in that relationship. And of course, the opposite of leadership is dependence. So European dependence on the United States for defense, for technology, and also an intellectual dependence. Um, the uh, the uh, European-Chinese relationship, which is increasingly reduced to the commercial relationship, I've had the opportunity to take part a good deal in Sino-Nordic academic relations for about 12 years. Um, and that's another discussion, but uh, that seems to be diminishing. Uh, I'm concerned for not... Uh, strong enough relations between Europe and the Nordics and the rest of the world. And of course, uh, the relations with Russia are practically gone. So that's the context. That's the global context. So to conclude, um, the United States is uh, understandably very determined to keep the post-Cold War order, uh, an order of American uh, predominance. Um, and that is what is usually called the rules-based order. Uh, but, as I said, order rests both on material power and legitimacy. And as is clear, the legitimacy is sliding and uh, humanity today is 8 billion people rising to 10 billion people. The West is about 1 billion people and it will stay at 1 billion people. Um, and when the others become richer with stronger science, stronger t technology, that world will slide. If we continue down that road, I do not see a change to the Arctic we have now. The Arctic will remain divided between what I call this US-led NATO Arctic and the Russian Arctic, where, of course, uh, Russia seeks all the BRICS economic and science and technology engagement it can. Um, the alternative, um, which is, of course, opening a very large question, is how does global governance look for a world where both material and immaterial power is distributed very differently? Inventing a governance system for that would be almost unimaginable. Well, fortunately, we do have the UN system with the Charter, the Security Council, the General Assembly, and all the specialized uh, agencies of the United Nations. And that, of course, raises the question, what will Arctic governance look like in such a radically different multipolar world? And I'll conclude here, but... Let me just finish on one point, and that is the Arctic we had for the last 30 years rested on a post-Cold War international order. That post-Cold War international order is not coming back. So there's no way back to the Arctic we had before two years ago. Thank you very much for your attention. I once again open the floor for questions. Anyone have any questions? So we could start with uh, a question from the online participants. So, so uh, given this uh, polarity, um, an anonymous attendee asks, to what extent will Russia accept and or tolerate a Chinese physical presence beyond financial investment within the Arctic? Uh, I mean, uh, the Arctic is, uh, is absolutely, the Arctic is absolutely crucial for uh, Russia's both defense and also its, uh, its economy. 
So <laughs> Russia will defend its Arctic uh, very vigorously towards anybody. But of course, uh, they are financially very dependent. Well, I mean, until the Crimean annexation, until the full-scale invasion of Ukraine, it was very clear Russia was aiming for a balanced energy system concerning uh, trade and investment with, uh, I mean, energy going west to Europe, going east to East Asia, and with both European and East Asian capital. And now, of course, the Western leg of that system has been cut off both in terms of the trade and the capital and the technology. And that, of course, makes Russia much more de dependent on especially the Chinese leg. Also India. India is a very important actor in this. Uh, there's much speculation about uh, Chinese um, military presence in the Arctic. Uh, I am I'm very skeptical about those, uh, those speculations. So China and the United States have an ever increasingly, how do you say, tense relationship. And of course, between nuclear weapon states, nuclear weapon states, they have a very different way of thinking than, for example, Nor uh, Nordic countries, which do not have nuclear weapons. So nuclear weapon states always have to think all the way to Armageddon. So how does... Taiwan. How does a war over Taiwan end with Sino-American use of nuclear weapons against each other? And there, of course, the Sino-American mutual nuclear deterrence is absolutely key. And the Arctic plays an important role in that. Think about all the missile defense infrastructure in Alaska. But I don't see the purpose for China of basing strategic missile submarines in the Arctic. They cannot get into the Arctic undetected. The Bering Strait is very shallow. It's fully controlled by the United States and Russia. Are the Chinese submarines supposed to sail all the way south of Africa or South America? And they, they're going to have no protection, no support. I mean, I think the Chinese... Uh, the Chinese nuclear deterrence is going to be based on land-based uh, land missiles, which are being very much expanded now, and submarine-based in the Bohai Sea and close to, uh, close to China. I mean, <clears throat> for me, it's, it's very hard to imagine a Chinese military presence in the Arctic. Thank you. Pass the uh, speaker over to Ampla. Hello, Rasmus. This is Ampla. Hello. Thank you for your presentation. We're missing you already here in Akureyri. I hope you're enjoying Svalbard. It sounds cold and dark, even more so than here. Um, I'm wondering, because you discussed the potential of a divided governance structure in the Arctic, the Arctic Seven on one hand, and Russia and whomever they choose to cozy you up to on the other hand. In my mind, this is a recipe for disaster for the future. Um, of the region. Could you perhaps elaborate or share your insight on what that could mean for the next few decades? Well, I mean, the disaster, and uh, disaster, the big and small disasters. Uh, of course, the Nordic countries, the United States and Canada, I mean, we are, are very similar countries in terms of societies, values, culture, etc. I had the opportunity before to also participate in, in uh, Norwegian-Russian uh, academic relations. And of course, uh, Russia was perhaps the, how do you say, the, the exotic other before in many Arctic settings. I think what I have noticed in Arctic conferences um, since February last, uh, 2022, um, it is how quickly you forget how quickly you forget about the russian arctic how quickly you forget about the russian collaboration the russian participation and as i say i mean between the nordic countries and the canada and the united states it's, it's almost too easy to get along i mean we can sit next week arctic frontiers um 
uh, we can sit the next week at Arctic Frontiers in Tromsø uh, very uh, very nicely and the Arctic Circle in Reykjavik, etc., etc. So that's perhaps a smaller catastrophe. Uh, when it comes to, for example, climate science, well, as has been pointed out, that you cannot build these global models if you don't have global input of data. And there, uh, I mentioned the importance of the United Nations system, as you may have noticed in my introduction, that I spent a couple of years with the United Nations University in, in Japan. I became a great fan of the UN system of multilateralism. Um, and for example, the World Meteorological Organization in Geneva is as far as I know, one of the very few places where that kind of data can be exchanged today. Then we have, uh, I have mentioned uh, nuclear deterrence, I've mentioned arms control, uh, strategic stability. Uh, we're talking about the destruction of mankind uh, in the uh, worst, very worst case scenario. And of course, arms control and deterrence and uh, strategic stability are diplomatically, scientifically, tech technologically extremely demanding endeavors which require, I think, um, uh, diplomatic, scientific, technological knowledge shared between the two sides at the very highest level. During the Cold War, the United States and the Soviet Union had very sophisticated arms control diplomacy. That's perhaps why humanity is still here. And uh, it's very hard to manage these very dangerous things if you don't have a very, very strong uh, intellectual connection with your counterpart. And that has nothing to do with what you otherwise think about that counterpart. Thank you. Uh, our online participants, more and more. But uh, I'm fearing that you have to leave in a minute and a half no no uh, actually uh well i i was supposed to continue somewhere else here in in, in long but uh but i have uh i've canceled that so uh Go i have more leeway okay yeah that's excellent um so an interesting question here so sanatha is asking in quotes my inquiry is centered on the implications of a divided approach to Arctic governance and its potential impact on the development of the Northern Sea Route. Would this division impact the economic development of the Northern Sea Route in the upcoming years? And how so? Uh, yeah, uh, thank, thank you very much. Well, I mean, as I say, I, I think it was clear from especially the uh, the huge Yamal liquefied natural gas project that Russia, before the Crimean annex uh, annexation of Crimea, before the full-scale invasion of Ukraine, um, Russia was very deliberately seeking such a balanced system going east and west, and, and it's not going west anymore. And that, of course, means that it will be... Um, it will be more and more dominated by uh, BRICS, BRICS economic interests, uh, BRICS science, BRICS technology. Um, the West, uh, understandably, has been trying to slow down Russian activities, Russian economy, through financial sanctions, through uh, technological sanctions. And I think, for example, the Yamal, uh, LNG project was very dependent on Western technology. And I think there were headlines recently about now that you have more and more and more and more advanced Chinese technology being shipped there. And I have the opportunity to uh, visit for research, visit for guest teaching top institutions in, in Beijing and Shanghai. And I mean, when you when you see the size of the talent pool, when you see the talent, well, then it's not surprising that eventually, of course, such a huge talent pool with resources will uh, catch up. Perfect, thank you. Um, a round of applause for Erasmus. Thank you again. Um, so uh, we are nearing the end. Uh, I would just like to uh, offer Ambla a brief uh, moment to conclude.
with some final remarks for the for the seminar. If you would. Did you say half an hour? No, no, I'm just teasing. I'm standing between you and a reception, so I'm <laughs> going to say just a couple of things. So my name is Ampla Oddsdottir. I'm director of the Icelandic Arctic Cooperation Network. Um, I just want to uh, take a brief moment to thank uh, the co-organizers, Wardberg and the University of Akureyri, uh, and the Norwegian Embassy for, I believe, hosting also our reception. David or David, it's been an utter delight to work on you, <coughs> work on this with you, and uh, I hope that we can continue our collaboration in the future. I have been criticized, and we may have to be more mindful next time of the gender balance of the panel. Uh, but most of all, I would like to thank uh, Njord and Matthew and Rasmus, who is gone, or um, she should be listening now. Okay. Uh, for their excellent and thought-provoking contributions. Uh, we've had a dynamic conversation here today. Uh, you reminded us that these are not simple questions, but rather issues that have multiple dimensions uh, and levels of complexity. The situation is not black and white, and finding a nuanced resolution is absolutely critical. You also reminded us of the importance of of the great importance of an open and critical dialogue, something we should not take as a given uh, or treat with disdain. You've also given us a plethora of questions to ponder over when we consider the future of the Arctic region and whether sustainable development can be achieved in the region under current circumstances. I want to thank you all for that. Uh, and also for going above and beyond the call of duty and battling through darkness and storm to be able to be here with us today. Uh, these two drove over from Reykjavik this morning, uh, woke up at five o'clock in the morning, so that does um, bear witness to your commitment to this topic. We hope to see you again very soon in the future, and uh, I wish you every luck with the uh, very small task of resolving the cu uh, current situation. And with that, I give the floor to Fredrik. I believe that we're about to have some refreshments. Yes. Thank you all for coming here today. I couldn't have possibly said it better, so I'll just leave it on a personal note and just once again offer my sincere gratitude to all of our speakers and also well all of our attendees, um, both in person and online uh, for a wonderful attendance and fantastic participation, I may add. Um, lastly, I would just like to then bid you all uh, on behalf of the Norwegian Embassy in Reykjavik uh, to our reception. Uh, hype us up to some foods and drink, and I look forward to in sharing in them with you all. So thank you, everyone. So.